Uh, now we're going to bring in Andy McFarland, uh, and uh, he's uh, way up north in Traverse City. And uh, for those who don't know, I, this is uh, my business and technology show, but for the last couple of years, we've also been covering cannabis business. Uh, business is business. And so last year, the business was pretty good, about $1.8 billion. Some predictions, it may be up to $3 billion this year. So it's a pretty legitimate number. Well, it's a number three cash car from the state now. <laughs> so uh, it, it's doing well. And whether we're your, whatever your opinions are on cannabis, it's still a viable business area. And one of the new areas that is being explored by Andy and his compatriots is uh, cannabis tourism. Uh, for a lot of people, they, you know, Michigan's a big tourist state, um, and they're trying to combine that idea with people that want to find some place like an Airbnb, a bar, a restaurant, whatever, where they can consume either on premises or very nearby. And so, what uh, Andy has and his and his uh, the board members have created, and as a disclaimer, I've just come on board as a communications lead because I thought it was a pretty good idea. It's called Michigo, Michigo.org, right? Yeah. Yeah. So um, I'll, I'll let you run with the ball here and explain it better than I did. All right. Well, cool. Thanks for having me, Mike. Yeah. Um, so the, the main focus of Michigo, as you identified it, is cannabis tourism. We are trying to help create the conditions to make cannabis tourism successful and we're looking you know to the same lessons that have been learned you know demonstrated through the pure michigan campaign with uh, wine tourism in michigan with uh, alcohol tourism and you know with pretty much every other kind of tourism you know basically any product any experience has an audience and one of the nice things for michigan is that cannabis tourism has a huge audience. It's something that people are very interested in, very open to. And so that's why when um, I was contacted by the um, people forming uh, the Michigan Cannabis Hospitality Industry Growth Organization or Michigan, I jumped right on board. You know, it's um, basically, you know, there there is evidence out there that shows that for example, wine tourists um, have kind of a deeper experience and spend more dollars in the state because they're kind of more interested in getting out there and, and doing things. And that's the same sort of thing you see when you study cannabis tourism, that people are very interested in things like farm markets, antiques, like all that hiking, all this kind of stuff that keeps them in an area, keeps them, you know, buying food, keeps them sleeping in you know beds and basically spending more money in the state yeah so and let's talk a little bit about your background uh your you also cover cannabis business but uh, more in the area of events and activities and things like that right y yeah um i uh, am the founder of the michigan cannabis trail which uh seeks to connect um uh, residents of the state and visitors with authentic cannabis experiences in the state of Michigan. So we've got a guide to uh, recreational dispensaries, the dispensaries that anybody can go to, and there's well over 300 of those. Um, and to that, we've added a cannabis event calendar that's um, very popular. You know, we've got tons of events in there. And obviously, you know, we're heading up on the high holy day of cannabis, a uh, 420. So if you look around that, you can see so many events and, and even some festivals. And I'll tell you, you know, as you know, we used to do like wine events and wine festivals when I was uh, running the Leon wine trail. And I, I would never have thought that we would be investing in festivals in April. You know, and these are big festivals, you know, like the, the Lansing 420 Music Festival. I mean, they've got, you know, they've got a heck of a wine. You know, you know, that'll just blow you away. And it's right downtown at Adato Park in Lansing. You know, this is the real deal. Yeah, and certainly there's a lot of other events uh, in April, which, you, as you say, the, for, for those who don't know, 420 is the slang term. Gosh, I think it came out of California 
for someone that's re- at the end of the day or whatever is going to relax and, and smoke up or something. And so 420 was the term. So, uh, but there's uh, there's events. I know there's one, there's a reggae festival. I live in the Ann Arbor here. here. And there's one in Ypsilanti, just a stone's throw away at the end of April. And then uh, there's a, you're also seeing big cannabis events where it's like trade shows, uh, where it's really, really aimed at businesses, not so much consumers. And there's a whole slug of those as well. And then as the summer wears on, you get more into the business to consumer stuff where it's a traditional festival and you throw in cannabis on top of it, right? Yeah, yeah. And I think one of the really interesting things that, that we're seeing now is just a bunch of dispensaries that are putting events on. You know, I know um, Jars Cannabis had a rail jam. Um, there, there's been dance competitions. There's been uh, wrestling competitions around cannabis, you know, and there's, you know, just so many different things that people are, are blending with cannabis. Um, and one of the reasons that really pushed me towards Michigan was the fact that the one area that Michigan is really lacking in the cannabis space is, is we're lacking cannabis lodging options. You know, it's uh, so few of them are out there. We have our um, 420 friendly lodging page at michigancannabistrail.com slash lodging has lodging and camping options. And there's less than 20 of them in the state. And we are actively digging these out. So um, we've started, you know, working to bring more of those in. Um, We've uh, uh, worked with organizations to, to, to kind of educate people about it, but it is, there's an opportunity out there that is just mind blowing. You know, when you, when you think about it, cause people who are traveling, you know, to experience legal cannabis, you know, they don't want to then have no place to consume it, you know, or feel like they're, you know, breaking the law or break, breaking the rules. So um, we think it's, you know, I thought through the cannabis trail that it was very important to get involved in this. And thankfully, you know, Michigan has, has taken that and they're running with it. So so how do they typically do that? I know uh, there are prohibitions uh, in, in various places like a bar. You can't smoke cigarettes or cigars. And so you, therefore you couldn't smoke cannabis. But in terms of lodging, I, I'm not sure what the rules are on that. Do you know? Well, I mean, basically lodging, you know, you you uh, kind of in the especially in the Airbnb space, you sort of make your your own rules. Um, It's a lot it's a lot different when you're talking about the national change, you know, the Marriott's, those sort of companies. But when you're you know, when you're creating a bed and breakfast or something like that, that's basically up to you creating that space, you know, how you choose to create it. You know, it's. It's definitely legal to allow people to smoke cannabis in your rental. And, you know, most of the Airbnbs that I see actually create an outdoor space for smoking or like a sunroom sort of thing, basically to kind of both protect their rental from smoke smells, but also, you know, you don't want people with fire inside your rental typically. So. Yeah, again, I, I figured that's probably what it was. And since we, and particularly where you are, we are a four season state. Uh, today, luckily, it's 65 degrees, but it's Michigan, <laughs> you know, so there's a lot of really cold days. And so you don't want to make those poor people stand outside the front door and in, in like the old days when they sneak outside to smoke a cigarette on their break or something, you know. So I was just curious how they were doing it. But it seemed like the the Airbnb angle would be the perfect solution since uh, that's not typically run by some big chain or something or other. It's independently owned by mom and pop or, you know, whatever. And, and so, like you say, it seems like that would be the logical place. Uh, and perhaps moving forward, as, as we've discussed many times on many shows, it remains an educational process. Uh, the whole reefer madness kind of mentality still lingers. And uh, I think folks would be surprised how many people actually smoke cannabis to some degree in this state. It's quite a lot. Uh, but mo- but most of them are kind of quiet about it. They don't really advertise it, right? Yeah, I mean, typically, you know, uh, you know, you're seeing that change a lot. You know, people like me. I mean, I've been a medical cannabis patient for uh, six years now. You know, dealing dealing with successfully with uh, prostate cancer 
answer, but you know, so I'm, I don't have any problem telling people, you know, that I consume, but yeah, it's still something that, you know, some people are uncomfortable about it. And that's, you know, that's one reason that we really want to get cannabis lodging, you know, to be accepted out there because, you know, there's, I, I struggle to think of a rental that I've ever seen that says no alcohol. You know, I, I don't know. Have you ever seen one? No. Um, yeah. You know, it's just not. And, and when you think about it, you know, alcohol kills hundreds of thousands of people each year and tens of thousands of people each year in Michigan. As far as I know, cannabis has yet to kill a Michigander, you know, and I'm not saying that cannabis is hundred percent perfectly safe, but what I am saying is that, we are dealing with the hangover of prohibition and it's really time for us to sober up and realize that that doesn't need to happen. You know, we are, we are turning, you know, we're turning away so many dollars, you know, and right now we're in a good situation in that um, our neighbors for the most part, you know, when you think of Ohio, Indiana, Wisconsin, none of them have legal cannabis. Illinois has it, you know, but we we've had it for a little bit longer, you know, and and I really think that this is the point where Michigan can um, Michigan can get out in front of this, you know, and, and basically establish ourselves as a four season cannabis tourism destination. You know, one of the things we found when we did our um, something I'd encourage all your listeners to check out if they're interested in the Canada tourism space is to head over to michigo.org and download our 2021 Canada tourism report. One of the um, things that we identified with that is that Detroit is within a um, five hour drive of um, like 50 million um, people. And that's, that's higher than Los Angeles, that's higher than Las Vegas, that's, you know, that's higher than almost any space that's like being thought of as, you know, the cannabis destination. And I think that, you know, Michigan with our, with our very visible Pure Michigan brand, I think that we can get out there and get that space because our, what we offer here in Michigan, that four seasons of fun, that is exactly what cannabis tourists want to want to enjoy. Yeah, we just got to get, uh, speaking of pure Michigan, you got to get the MEDC behind this now at some point. Um, they may or may not. Of course, the governor is very supportive. The attorney general is very supportive. But uh, I don't know whether you guys have reached out to the MEDC to see if pure Michigan, because they, they throw a lot of money around for various tourism campaigns, but I don't think they've got behind Slash tourism for cannabis, camp. right? They they have not yet. Um I believe that um, one of the big concerns they have is the fact that it is still federally illegal. And um, the MEDC and Pure Michigan work very extensively with um, uh, um, uh, with the uh, uh, CVBs, Convention and Visitors Bureaus. And those, uh, that's, as I understand it, that's sort of a federal law and a federal funding mechanism. And that's why I've heard from a lot of the organizations why they haven't jumped in yet. But we have seen, I was just involved um, in a uh, uh, cannabis B&B uh, seminar, webinar with uh, Dunegrass Cannabis that uh, one of the guests was um, Dan Sipple from the West Michigan Tourism Association. And they're the, I believe, the oldest continually operating tourism association in the country, headquartered in Grand Rapids. And their funding mechanism is a little bit different. And they actually have a cannabis guide this year. Hmm. And they are, you know, kind of embracing cannabis as part of the tourism experience. So, you know, my feeling, and I, I have seen one CVB, the uh, Muskegon Convention and Visitors Bureau, I did see them promote the Muskegon pre-roll trail last summer where you could go to different dispensaries and get a stamp and then at the end, you know, get like a free pre-roll. Um, so definitely communities are jumping in and I feel like it's, you know, Michigan needs to jump in before the other states, but the same, you know, with communities in the state, if you want to get in there and if, you know, lodging is important to your future, I think, you know, getting in there with a, a supporting cannabis tourism is going to be a, a big thing for communities in 2022. All right. Well, we're coming down towards the end. So why don't you provide some uh, contact information if people want to reach out to Michigan or you, how do they do that? 
Well, if you want to reach out to Michigo, just head over to michigo.org, M-I-C-H-I-G-O dot O-R-G. Um, click, you know, click the email us link. And um, if you want to contact me personally, you can go to michigancannabistrail.com. You can also email me at farlane at gmail.com. And, uh, you know, definitely would like to hear you, especially if you've got a lodging space that, that you're using for um, cannabis lodging, or if you've got events that you think uh, could go on our calendar. All right.